I think we would have missed the boat tonight if we didn't just read the gospel. Uh, read what Jesus experienced. Read what happened. You know, all four gospels spend a lot of space on the crucifixion of Jesus. You know, you just kind of count how many verses are spent on each event. All of them slow down when it comes to the death of Jesus. And there's a lot of space, there's a lot of ink in the, in the Bible dedicated to this. So I, I want us just to, to hear the word of God. Uh, we're going to start at Matthew. We're going to be Matthew's gospel tonight. I just want to read starting at verse 27. And if those could be up on the screen... Um, I'll just read right off the screen, and you'll see it on your screen as well. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him, and they took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own, his own clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, there they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross that we may believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I'm the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after uh, res Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable to thee on this Good Friday. You are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. Well, I feel like we need to keep it simple uh, tonight. And uh, I just want to give you the unvarnished uh, message of the cross as best as I can proclaim it to you. 
We need to hear again the good news. We need to hear again what Jesus has done for us. You know, we all love Easter, but let me tell you what, this is an important stop to make because unless you visit Good Friday, Easter doesn't have the power. There's got to be Good Friday before, before there's an Easter. And uh, I just want to talk about that strange phrase, Good Friday. And I want to ask the question, what's so, what's so good about Good Friday? Because after all, as we just read, Good Friday was a horrific day for Jesus. I just want to tell you a few things, uh, just to remind you of a few things. What did Good Friday mean uh, for Jesus? Well, one thing it meant for Jesus, I want you to think about this. The cross for Jesus meant full exposure to the wrath of evil. One of the ways the Bible talks about um, Jesus' crucifixion, and Jesus talked about it this way as well, um, is him being delivered up or delivered over. Jesus was delivered into the hands of evil. In Acts chapter 2, um, it says, hey, this Jesus was delivered up. Um, you yourselves know that uh, you saw this. He was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Uh, you, he cru you crucified and killed he was crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He was delivered up. Um, Matthew 26, Jesus uh, predicted he would be delivered up. Romans 4 says Jesus was delivered up for our, trans our trespasses. He was given over. He was put in the power of someone else. Uh, no buffer, no limits. I want you to think about that for a little bit. There was no referee to say, oh, that's too much. You've gone too far. He gave, gave himself fully into the hands of evil. He relinquished himself. He relinquished his rights. In 1974, there was, a, there was an artist by the name of Marina Abramovic. And uh, she did kind of living art, uh, provocative stuff. And uh, in 1974, she did this exhibit. She had an audience. And... She put 72 items out, and it was everything from feathers and honey and lipstick and a rose to a gun and a knife, all these different items. And she put a sign up that said, you can do anything you want to me during the season of this exhibit, during this time period, and uh, there'll be no legal repercussions or any negative repercussions. And uh, it was kind of a living experiment. And it started out uh, playful enough. People kind of realized they could tickle her with a feather or whatever. And, and, but then it, it got more and more violent as it went along. And it ended with her breaking from her passive role and, and putting a stop to it. Uh, and she was bleeding, and, um, and, and she, talked about, she talked about that experience. She says, what I learned was that if you leave it up to the audience, they can kill you. I felt really violated. They cut up my clothes. They stuck rose thorns in my stomach. One person aimed a gun at my head, and another took it away. It created an aggressive atmosphere. Can you imagine just being fu fully in the power of evil to, to do whatever they wanted to do? And that's what it meant for Jesus. Another thing that Good Friday meant, the cross meant for Jesus, is being numbered with the wicked. Um, this is trivial, but have you ever had that experience of being pulled over? for a, Maybe you're going a little too fast. Maybe your license plate's expired. A police officer pulls you over, and you're sitting there, and people, you know what they do, don't they? they? They slow down, don't they? You know, and they, and they, they want to see who it is that got, they got caught. That's such a trivial thing, and it's probably part of the, uh, it's good for us. Maybe we won't be so quick to drive so fast next time. It's kind of the, kind of the walk of shame, you know, for, to be out there and say, oh my goodness, I hope no one sees me. Uh, and, and we know that the horror of that, even though 99 times out of 100, we probably deserve to be pulled over when we have that uh, happen to us. Uh, Jesus did not deserve that, yet he was numbered with the wicked. Luke 22, verse 37, 
um, says, it is written, he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you, this must be fulfilled in me. Jesus at the Last Supper predicting that he would be numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12 says, he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You know, um, it says in, um, it says in, um, in uh, Deuteronomy that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Now the Romans, he, they weren't talking about Roman crucifixion, but it certainly applies. And, you know, the Romans did crucifixion to make a public spectacle out of people that did the wrong thing. There were three executions scheduled for that day. Two of them were thieves, and one of them was an insurrectionist. Jesus ended up on the cross uh, that was uh, planned for Barabbas. They let him go and they crucified Jesus instead. He was, he was numbered among the wicked. He was numbered among the transgressors. What did the cross mean to Jesus? It meant being tortured without mercy. You know, Jesus really faced triple punishment. He had a, he had a, his first trial was, uh, he actually had one or two trials among the religious authorities. And the religious authority could inflict pain on you. What they did was kind of like caning. You know, they, they had a limit to what they could do. But they gave Jesus everything they could within the limits of the law give him and probably then some. But they wanted to crucify him, so they had to take him to the, the Roman authority. And normally the Roman authority would decide if you were guilty of death or not, uh, deserving death. And if you were, they would crucify you. But we know that Pontius Pilate, we looked at this Sunday, he was trying to get out of crucifying Jesus. And he, instead of kind of administering justice, he got into this thing of trying to appease the crowd. And one way he did that was submitting Jesus over to flogging. And this was different than the, the beating that Jesus received uh, from the hands of the, the Jewish authorities. Uh, Eusebius is an early church historian, and, um, and he writes, um, you know, with the memory of what all this was about, what the Roman government could, could do. And he said, the sufferer's veins were laid bare, and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were ex open to exposure. He was then taken to the praetorium where a crown of thorns was thrust on his head. He was forced to heavy, he, carry a heavy crossbar on his bleeding shoulders until he collapsed. When they reached the site of the crucifixion, he was stripped naked. He was laid on the cross and six inch nails were driven into his forearms just above the wrist. His knees were then twisted sideways so that the ankles could be nailed between the tibia and the Achilles tendon. He was lifted up on the cross, which was then dropped into a socket on the ground. And there he was left to hang in intense heat, in unbearable thirst, exposed to the ridicule of the crowd. He hung there in unthinkable pain for six hours while his life slowly drained away. It was the height of pain and it was the death of, depth of shame. The Roman government in the 300s outlawed crucifixion because it was just too cruel even for them. Jesus suffered. The cross meant for Jesus also watching the agony of his loved ones. You know, uh, Mary was there, the mother of Jesus. John tells us that Jesus looked down from the cross and Basically said, John, I want you to take care of my mother. You know, it's one thing to suffer. I think it's another layer of suffering to, to see your loved one suffering because you're suffering, if you, if you get what I'm saying. In Luke chapter 2, there was a prophecy spoken over, G, over Mary when Jesus was just a few days old. 40 days old, they went to the temple and they offered the sacrifices for him. And uh, Simeon comes up and says, hey, this, this child will mean the rising and falling of many, of, of many in Israel. He'll be a sign that's spoken against. The thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. He said this to Mary. And I wonder if Mary remembered the words of Simeon when she stood there and watched her son dying. This was the sword that would pierce her soul. The cross of Jesus for Jesus meant separation from the Heavenly Father. 
Matthew 27, verse 46 tells us that Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Jesus started his earthly ministry with these words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus lived in the fellowship with his heavenly father. He said in John's gospel, my father and I are one. And here he's quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? An experience of God forsakenness. What's up with that? Why did Jesus experience this God forsakenness, although he's the son of God? Well, Paul describes it in this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became our sin on the cross and experienced the forsakenness of that. And then finally, what did the cross mean for Jesus? It meant being swallowed by death. You know, death is a fearful thing. Uh, it's scary. In some ways, it's unnatural. I mean, the death rate is still, what, 100%, something like that. But um, there's an, something unnatural about death. There's a horror to it. And, you know, I've, uh, I've been in the room when many people have passed, and death is ugly. And sure, there have been times where death kind of came as a friend in a way that there was suffering, and so... You know, it was released from that. But, but death is always a fearful thing. That's what the cross meant to Jesus. It meant death. It meant separation. It meant suffering, trauma, being handed over. But that's not the reason we call it Good Friday. We call it Good Friday because of what the cross means to us that believe in Jesus, that look to him, that, that worship him, that, that name him as our Savior. And so I want to give you, what does the cross mean to, to us? Why do we call it Good Friday? Well, first of all, it means death has been defanged. Thanks be to God. Jesus entered into death. You know, there's an old hymn that says, there's a light in the valley of death now for me. Since Jesus came into my heart. Our big brother Jesus has been there before us. And, and um, it says in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews is such a rich book. I spent some time in Hebrews today. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those uh, all of and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. The death of Jesus means that death has been defanged for us. Jesus has broken death's power. Thanks be to God. The cross means for us, second, that we're infinitely valued by God. You ever wonder what you're worth to God? Well, Good Friday has the answer to that. My friend Tim Brinkman, who's here tonight leading worship, he, he gave a sermon not too long ago, says, you were worth one Jesus. We're each worth one Jesus. God gave his only son for us. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says, uh, we, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with us, with him graciously give us all things? If God is willing to give Jesus for us, that means we're of infinite value to the heavenly father. We're of infinite worth. He loves us infinitely. Good Friday means for us that we have a God that knows our suffering. You know, Paul would often relish in this. We're getting ready to, to switch over to Paul uh, in just uh, next weekend, weekend after Easter. And Paul would talk about the fellowship of Christ's suffering. You know, when Paul, when Paul had to suffer, he, he leaned on the fact that he had a God that knew what suffering was all about. And, and that's really highlighted in the prophecies of Jesus. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, it says he was despised and he was rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Jesus, our great high priest, knows what it means to suffer. He knows what it means to be confined. 
in Hebrews chapter 2, I'll go back to that. It says, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything existed, should make the pioneer of their uh, salvation perfect through what he suffered. Uh, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers or sisters. I always scratch my head at this, at this passage because it says Jesus was made perfect through suffering. Well, wasn't Jesus perfect before he suffered? Well, what's going on here? Why does it say Jesus was made perfect? Somebody finally explained it to me. In, in suffering, Jesus became our perfect Savior. He became perfect for us. Just the Savior we needed. Because we have a, we have a God that knows what it is to suffer. We have a Savior, a high priest that knows what it is to suffer. And so when we're going through difficult times, we know that we're, we're not alone. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Good Friday, we have an example of perfect love. I love John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than he that lays down his life for his friends. You know why we're so thankful for doctors who are working around the clock and nurses. You know, there's nurses now that are working in hospitals and they don't want to go home to their family. So some of them are in mobile home, um, like, like uh, trailer homes. Uh, some of them uh, are staying in, you know, kind of guest houses and garages and different places. They're separated and they're putting themselves in, in harm's way. There's EMTs, there's police officers, first responders. And, and you know what, uh, we Christians, we always highlight this because uh, when we see something like that, when we, somebody, when we see somebody putting themselves at risk for somebody else, we, we say that's an echo of the love of Jesus. You know, that's, that's getting into the agape kind of love that Jesus showed for us so beautifully on the, on the cross. Greater love has no one than, than this, that he that lays down his life for his friend. We have this example of beautiful, perfect love. In Good Friday, we're free from the prison of our past. This is good news, folks. Uh, Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And that's not a good way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray, but God has laid on him our iniquity. And if it's on him, that means it's no longer on us. I want to go back to 2 Corinthians 5.21. I shared this in the negative. For our sake, he who made him to be sin who knew no sin. That's what it meant for Jesus. And here it is for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Because of what Jesus accomplished on his cross, our standing before God is righteous. Because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, he has taken the weight of my past, my sin, all those things that I've thought wrong, said wrong, done wrong, all those things that violate God's holy love. God has taken the burden of that on his son Jesus and has left me standing before God as righteous. Thanks be to God. I am free from the prison of my past because what Christ has done for me. One more point here, okay? What does Good Friday mean for us? We have a perfect path to a relationship with the Heavenly Father because of what Jesus has done for us. I want to read to you Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and let our bodies, and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. There's a new and living way opened up to us to, for a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And that way has been opened up, the author of Hebrews says, through the blood of Jesus. You know what? This brings me great comfort and um, in assurance as I live my life. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. I'm not saved by my puny efforts I'm not saved by um, 
uh, my good intentions, my perfect attendance at church, my, my uh, I'm a, have a career in ministry, uh, you know, whatever thing I might count for my credit, that's puny stuff, uh, that's, that's wavering stuff. I'm not saved by any of that stuff. I'm saved by nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I tell you what, I love the fact that Matthew pointed out in his gospel that when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. That veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies in the temple. And, it, and God was opening up, it was basically God saying, you're invited in. Uh, the, the price of admission to a relationship with me has been paid by me and by my son. And, and you, you can pass through the curtain now. Uh, you have a relationship with me. I, I tell you what, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Because Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I can say, Abba, Father. Do you hear that? Jesus experienced forsakenness so that I could experience adoption. Jesus experienced desolation so that I could experience salvation. Jesus allowed himself to be undone so that I could be redone. Thanks be to God. And let me just tell you this, church, all that are listening here, given all that the cross meant to Jesus and given all that the cross means to us, can we just gather our hearts together tonight as we close this Good Friday service and can we just say from the tip of our toes all the way up through the depth of our soul and out through our mouths, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Your desolation is my salvation. Your giving is my forgiving. Your abandonment is is my adoption. Oh, thanks be to God. Right where you're at, would you bow your heads? And let's just right now make our hearts a temple. And let's celebrate. The veil is torn. The barrier is removed between us and our Heavenly Father. Jesus, I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That you allowed yourself, your holy self, to be put in the hands of the power of evil for my sake. I thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. That you went through the physical suffering of the cross for me. I thank you, thank you, and thank you, Jesus. That you suffered looking, up, looking on Mary's face and seeing the distress there. But even greater, you felt the separation for the first time between you and the Heavenly Father. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you that a new way is opened up so that I could be made clean and right before you. That we're not saved with fleeting stuff. We're saved with the very blood of Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that fellowship is restored, that the past is handled and erased. And I have access to you through this new and living way through the curtain which is your flesh, broken for me. Lord, if there's anybody here within the sound of my voice that's never received this gift of salvation, I pray that you would just put it in their hearts to cry out just in a simple way, just like I'm crying out now. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me of my sins. I receive this free gift of salvation. Make me righteous through your blood and through your cross so that I might embrace the new life that you have for me. And Heavenly Father, we pray all these things with grateful hearts. And we pray it in the name of the one who died for us.
our Lord Jesus Christ. And we all say tonight, amen.